Poor student Ruby breaks into the office, but accidentally sees the teacher kissing her classmate Lydia. After catching this illicit relationship, Ruby runs away in panic. As the daughter of a millionaire, Lydia fears the scandal will come to light and ruin her family's reputation. She runs to her brother James in tears, telling him everything and begging him to find a solution. To help his sister, James immediately returns to the high school and interrupts the meeting to find Ruby. James is the school hunk but embodies all the flaws of the rich, outsized privilege, arrogance, and ignorance. Under his coercion, Ruby follows him out to a deserted corner. He puts hundreds of thousands of dollars in Ruby's hand and warns her to keep her mouth shut about what happened in the office. He says he'll pay Ruby double if she keeps quiet until the end of the school year. Ruby hates people who use money to insult others. She returns the money and turns to leave. James yanks on her and tries to humiliate her into submission. Ruby may be poor, but she wouldn't beg for sympathy from a rich kid. She throws all the bills in front of him and gives him a scornful smile. But their clash ignites an unexpected spark between them. They attend Maxton Hall, one of Germany's most prestigious and noble schools. Students here are either rich or aristocrats. They don't come here to study, they come here to party and find people of their own class to marry. Lydia and James come from the Beaufort family, which has more power and money than some royal families. But there is an exception. Ruby was born into poverty, but she was able to attend on a scholarship. She's never been a sucker for the rich, she even avoids them, preferring to remain invisible. Because she wanted to change her life on her own. She uses Maxton Hall as an entry ticket, hoping to get into Oxford in less than a year. But from the moment she found out Lydia's secret, her peaceful life was gone. Only then, she doesn't take James seriously, instead focusing on her studies and her family. After school, she goes to her part-time job at the restaurant, as she always does. And she works so hard to earn money not to buy things for herself, but to buy a stairlift for her paralyzed father. Her father's legs were amputated in an accident a few years ago, and he hasn't been upstairs since. Although the family of four lives in poverty, they never complain and actively look for beauty and joy every day. Ruby studies hard, hoping to enter a good university and lead her family to a better life, so she couldn't afford a misstep. Before the start of the school year, she had asked Mr. Sutton, who graduated from Oxford, to write a letter of recommendation for her. But after finding out about his affair, she firmly refused to accept his letter. Even though Mr. Sutton's private life is none of her business. If the scandal is found out by others, his recommendation will be worthless to her. So Ruby chooses to ask the headmaster for a recommendation. To her surprise, before she gets into the office, James suddenly drags her into a dark room to negotiate. It turns out Ruby's lack of commitment to keep the secret made him anxious. Seeing her unyielding attitude, he takes off his coat with the intention of prostituting himself. Ruby despises his behavior. Just as James is losing his patience, there's a loud noise from the stairwell. Ruby quickly pushes him into a corner. She is willing to keep the secret as long as James stays away from her. This shocks James a lot. She wants nothing to do with the most popular boy for fear of drawing attention to herself. However, fate has brought them together. It is all written in the stars. In the afternoon, everyone gathers in the field to watch the lacrosse game. Led by James, Maxton Hall's team has won two championships in a row. Just as James is about to shoot, he unexpectedly sees Ruby, the one he has to keep at arm's length, chatting and laughing with his teammate. He gets distracted by her fear that she's leaking, and his opponent takes the opportunity to run him over. It turns out Ruby's not here to watch the game, but to ask Headmaster for a letter of recommendation. The Headmaster turns it down without even thinking about it. He knows Ruby's an exemplary student, but that's not enough to warrant a recommendation. Maybe it's because she's never donated to the school to show him how capable she is. To see if she is a good leader, the Headmaster asks her to organize a welcome party. If it's successful, he's willing to write her a letter of recommendation. Ruby is delighted. On her way to organize it, James stops her and asks her what she was talking about with his teammate. In fact, she never wanted to snitch, and she didn't want to get involved in their rich people's business. But James mistakes her for a scheming girl and humiliates her. Winning big on the playing field, he revels in seeing the powerless girl take a loss. His intervention is like this downpour of rain that swirls her into a more complicated world, but it can't defeat her. Day after day, she devotes herself to the preparations for the welcome party. Soon it is time to test the fruits of her hard work and her leadership skills. Whether or not Ruby would get a letter of recommendation for Oxford depended on the event. At first, everything goes smoothly. Gradually, she relaxes, not realizing how childish James is. If he couldn't shut her up, he had to make sure no one believed her. So he pays to destroy her credibility. A couple of strippers show up at a classy party. They flirt with students and parents, even the headmaster. 
The parents, who pay tens of thousands of pounds a year, are left with a negative impression of the school. Looking at the smug James, Ruby realizes he's up to no good. The headmaster urgently calls James and Ruby into his office for a lecture. He is very disappointed with both of them and gives them the appropriate punishment. James is suspended from the lacrosse team. Ruby can't get a letter of recommendation from him because the party is a disaster and he can't vouch for her organizational skills. Unless she reveals what happened between her and James and why James pulled this prank on her. After some hesitation, Ruby doesn't spill that secret. She admits that she still needs to improve. In order to get the principal to change his mind about her organizational skills, she promises that she'll do a good job with the upcoming donor gala. Her answer completely takes James by surprise. He never expected that she would not want a letter of recommendation in order to keep her secret. The headmaster doesn't press the matter further, but wants the two of them to repair the school's sullied reputation. So he arranges for James to help organize the gala to make up for his misstep. But how can these haters be willing to work together? Despite being thrown out of the headmaster's room, neither of them would bow down. One comes from a noble background and won't let anyone order him around, while the other dares to defy the powers that be in order to get into Oxford. A war is about to break out between two gorgeous teenagers. Even though James has been suspended for his pranks, as a millionaire heir, he will never take orders from anyone. As soon as he arrives at school, he puts the team through a rigorous training program. The coach stops him and tells him he has to stay off the field this term. Well, of course James doesn't obey the coach. Since his family donates millions of pounds to the school every year, from the uniforms to the rent. So he doesn't take the headmaster or anyone else seriously. But he soon stops resisting. Because it is his father who ordered the suspension. However, he doesn't think it was his fault and blames Ruby for everything. If Ruby hadn't forced him, he wouldn't have ruined the party. He is determined not to let Ruby win the game, no matter how much his sister tries to dissuade him. Meanwhile, Ruby is discussing the preparations for the donation gala with the other committee members. Kieran comes up with the theme of black and white and designs a poster. As he's promoting how it encompasses the two sides of truth and hypocrisy, James interrupts. He mocks the theme as nothing new. He then says that the hall would be perfect for a Victorian-themed party. Elegant and decadent dress codes, lace napkins, candlelight and classical orchestral music would make for the best party ever. When he is asked about the poster design, James immediately goes to the drawing board to draw. In less than a minute he draws a Victorian woman. Ruby is blown away by his lifelike work and brilliant planning ideas. Although reluctant to support him, she respects the decisions of others. James' proposal finally gets a unanimous vote and is accepted by the committee. But the challenge is where can she find a Victorian dress for a poster shoot? Her friend Lynn suggests she ask James for help. Because Beaufort is one of the oldest luxury brands in England. His family has been collecting clothes for hundreds of years. With no other choice, Ruby has to throw her pride away and go to James. She asks him for permission to take some photos for a poster. James refuses without hesitation. Well, is this his revenge on Ruby? Just when Ruby doesn't know what to do, her sister Ember, who's a fashion obsessed, offers to help. Ember stays up all night and uses a dress as the basis for a Victorian dream gown that's almost like a museum piece. Ruby can't wait to send the good news to the rest of the committee. James smirks as he reads the message. To annoy her, he sends a message to the group in a condescending tone. Ruby is eager to read everyone's feedback, so she puts the iron on top of her dress. She is so angry at James' arrogant and contemptuous words that she doesn't notice the fire burning behind her. By the time she realizes it and puts out the fire, the dress has a big hole in it. Instead of blaming her, Ember continues to work on the dress, but it's not clear if the dress will be finished before the deadline. The next day, Ruby has another argument with James in class. At first, they discuss a philosophical question rationally. But when James brings up the subject of money, she can't take it anymore. Her comments cut James to the quick. He storms out of the classroom in a rage. It is only then that Ruby realizes she's gone too far. James has no outlet for his rage but to party and drink himself out of it. Because he realizes that he really doesn't have the power to change things. When he asks his father to let him return to the lacrosse team, his father not only refuses, but despises it as a girl's sport. His parents let him throw himself into investor receptions and new series launches as the face of young Beaufort. But even the speech that gets him all the praise was written by his sister. On the other hand, Ruby feels guilty when she thinks of James leaving the room in frustration. Under her father's tutelage, she decides to take responsibility for her mistakes. So she finds the courage to come to the school and talk to James. She admits that she was out of line and apologizes. Perhaps this is the first time James, who grew up in the materialistic high society, feels a person's sincerity. He lets down his walls and asks her how her dress is coming along. Ruby sadly says that the plan didn't work out and the dress was burnt. 
even though she couldn't make the best posters anymore. She looks on the bright side. Man kann eben nicht immer gewinnen. James instantly relates to her, perhaps due to his inability to make a change, or perhaps because Ruby evokes hope in him. When he gets home, he sketches in pencil the outline of the girl who touched him and saw through him. Looking at Ruby's face, a smile now comes over him instead of annoyance. However, his father arranges a blind date between families of equal social rank. Elaine comes from a very wealthy and prestigious family, and is very fond of James. So his father thinks Elaine is the perfect choice for James' wife. He doesn't push her away and continues to socialize with them in order to secure her family's investment. But that doesn't mean he gives in. With the comparison, he realizes the true greatness of a love that goes beyond the material and is truly equal in spirit. Immediately after the socializing, he messages Ruby and intends to take her to his family's collection to see the Victorian dresses. And when Ruby hears a car horn and sees him waiting for her outside the door, she's feel gant butterflies in stomach. He hurriedly changes into a nice dress and says goodbye to her family. When he sees her getting into the car, James stops painting. Ruby is pleasantly amazed at his sudden change of mind about helping her. James says it's no big deal to take some pictures of the dress. Ruby's interest in him increases and she asks him to confirm some rumors about his extravagant lifestyle. James answers all the questions and then asks her about her personal life. And as she speaks confidently about her poverty and her dreams, James' black and white world is painted in color. Upon arrival in London, the driver suddenly breaks sharply, causing the book to fall to the ground. Ruby picks it up and sees that he's drawn her house. James sheepishly grabs it and pretends that nothing has happened. Ruby seems to have read his mind, and the corners of her mouth are rising. Soon after, they arrive at the James family's collection in London. Ruby is fascinated by the antiques and artwork on display. The seamstress leads them to the costume showroom, introducing her to valuable Victorian dresses. This pink dress was also exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum. The seamstress says they're all replicas because the originals are too delicate to be made available to the public. But that doesn't stop her from liking them. With permission, she photos the dresses and shows them to the rest of the crew. But she wouldn't go too far because the dress price is more than her parents earn in a year. James sees how much she likes it and wants her to try it on. Ruby doesn't squirm anymore. She says she'll wear it as long as James follows suit. She then dresses up as a 19th century lady with the help of the staff. When Ruby no longer hides her beauty, James' heart skips a beat. He gets the staff to take pictures of her on the pretext that her family will want to see her as she is now. He even excitedly barges in to take a few pictures with her. Surrounded by happiness, they look like Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. James gets down on one knee and kisses the back of her hand. This arouses their desire to get closer and closer. Just when their lips are about to touch, James' father suddenly appears and interrupts the fantasy. James is afraid to look up, and Ruby's offer to shake hands with him is ignored. James' father despises poor girls. He even criticizes Ruby for not being worthy of wearing the queen's dress. Ruby is embarrassed by his relentless insults, but what hurts her the most is that James doesn't say a word from start to finish. She runs upstairs and quickly changes out of her dress and becomes a commoner again. After regaining her composure, she walks straight up to them to thank them and make a curtsy. King Charles. Although she is poor, she has a richer heart than they do. She refuses to ride in a luxury car and chooses to take the train back to Germany. Perhaps the crowded subways and streets are where she fits in. When she returns, she locks herself in her room all day and doesn't tell her family what's happened. But the rich had done her more harm than good. The next day, Ruby walks into school and senses that her classmates are looking at her strangely. She enters the hall and is surprised to find that a picture of her and James has been made into a poster for a gala fundraiser. She's always been the invisible one at school, but now she's been subjected to so many weird looks and has become the talk of the town. Some mean girls even make fun of her family. The pressure is too much for her to bear. She blames James for plastering her face all over the school. Even though James did it out of the kindness to show everyone how good she was. But it just proves that they're not from the same world. Not everyone likes to be the center of attention. She flees the classroom, returns home, and throws herself into her father's arms for comfort. James quickly catches up with her and offers an explanation. He knows he hurt her at the museum. He'd printed the poster to show her that he isn't the kind of guy who treats people like dirt. He invites Ruby to a party. Ruby cries and says she just wants to be invisible. She doesn't belong in the world of luxury or parties. She thinks if she wants to be successful she has to avoid rich people like him. James doesn't push her any further and makes his love known in a subtle way. Ruby, du bist nicht mehr unsichtbar. Nicht für mich. After hearing such sweet words, Ruby's joy overshadows her worry. 
When James mails her the queen's dress and asks her to wear it to the gala, she can't suppress her feelings for him any longer. At the same time, her teacher's words enlightened her. She gets up the courage to come out of her shell and go to the party to find James. The two of them, overwhelmed by love, swing freely with the music, oblivious to the class difference that separates them. Just as they are about to kiss, James' blind date pretends to slip and spills red wine on Ruby. To avoid a confrontation, James takes her out by the hand. He goes to grab his jacket and leaves her waiting by the pool. However, a rich kid deliberately throws her into the water, causing everyone to burst into laughter. James immediately jumps into the water and rescues her. Ruby shivers and looks pale, seemingly suffering from psychological trauma. James holds her tightly in his arms, looking daggers at his bad friends. But instead of wrestling with them, he calms the frightened Ruby. He puts his hoodie on her and takes her out of here. To give her a sense of security, he lets her hold his hand. After calming down, Ruby opens up and explains her trauma. It turns out she fell into the water in an accident when she was a child. Her father jumped into the water to save her, but his legs were cut off by the propeller of another boat moving on the water. Since then, his legs were amputated and he was confined to a wheelchair. Whenever she sees the water, Ruby feels guilty and thinks it's all her fault. She falls into James' arms to vent her emotions. As she reveals her vulnerability, the more James cherishes her. When Ruby wakes up, James' ocean blue eyes shine down on her. She's addicted to them and can't hide her desire. She takes off his hoodie and throws herself into his arms. Suddenly, a number of flashing lights come on. A bunch of rich kids are sneering at her from outside the car window. Ruby is startled and realizes it's a nice dream. She blushes when she remembers how close James was to her last night. How could James be any different? Ruby had traveled to every corner of his mind and hadn't left it all night. From early in the morning, the two begin frequent text chats about each other's middle names and last night's accident. James is taking her out into the sunshine in a practical way. Ruby Bell, can I sign this with me to flirt? The two walk into school shoulder to shoulder, causing quite a stir. Last night's photo of James carrying her out has gone viral on social media. Even his dad knows about it. In contrast to his anger, his son is much happier. James, who lives under the watchful eye of others since childhood, confidently teaches her how to disguise herself with nonchalance. Ruby is the center of attention, and everywhere she goes, girls follow her to gossip. She can no longer remain invisible, but as soon as James shows up, all those complicated looks are eclipsed by him, and James is getting jealous. He would flirt with Ruby whenever she speaks to other boys, but he doesn't know yet that he's lost control of his feelings. They set up for the fundraising gala together. It is the first school party James has ever looked forward to. And to his surprise, the day of the party is also Ruby's birthday. Just as the two make sheep's eyes at each other, Kieran runs over to Ruby and tells her to check out the fresh ingredients that he's bought. 150 live partridges waiting to be served. What a shock! Kieran's definition of fresh ingredients is living creatures. To save Ruby the trouble, James gathers his friends and moves the aviaries out into the open. While he is drunk in love, a crisis strikes. Unfortunately, the launch of Beaufort's new collection is the same day as a fundraising gala. In an attempt to break up this relationship of class differences, his father purposely arranges for James to socialize with the head of PR after the launch. When James suggests that he wants to go to the gala, his father warns him with a picture of Ruby being pushed into the pool. Superficially, his father gives him the freedom to choose between Crush and his family. But in reality, he's using patriarchal power to oppress James. The following day, Ruby's birthday arrives. Her family buys her a cake and presents her with the Oxford prep series she's always wanted. James sends her a Beaufort leather bag with her initials on it and a picture of her that he has sketched inside. Ruby's face beams with happiness, unaware of the heartbreaking moment that's coming her way. Hours before the fundraising gala, she rushes to the school to hunt because the partridges have escaped their cages. After receiving a text message from her asking for help, James joins the hunt. Uh, hey, Ruby. Happy birthday. While resting, he plucks the bird's feathers from Ruby's head to hold them in his hand, as if he is touching the girl he loves so much. He apologizes that he can't come to the gala tonight because he has to go to the launch of a new collection. At the same time, he makes it clear that he doesn't want to take over the company or even go to Oxford. He is nothing more than his family name. On the face of it, James has a lot of privileges and opportunities. But those are all because of his family. He doesn't get to decide anything. He barely even knows what he wants. Ruby encourages him to follow his instincts and find what he really wants. She couldn't help him with material things. All she knew was that he loved to play lacrosse. So she goes to the headmaster and says that James' contribution to the party is huge. If the party is a success, it will be thanks to James. She begs the headmaster to allow James to go back to lacrosse field. After considering it for a while, the headmaster agrees. Which meant that the party meant a lot to both Ruby and James. 
But James has no idea what she's done for him. After parting with reluctant goodbyes, he gets in the car with his sister and heads to the launch party. The Beaufort siblings have their own problems. James hasn't even memorized his speech yet. On the contrary, his sister knows the speech by heart because she wrote it. It turns out that Lydia has always been good at business and management. The concepts and ideas for the new collection are all her work. But her father, who favors sons over daughters, gives all his attention to James and treats Lydia as plan B only. Apart from discussing about James or threatening her to break up with the teacher, her father barely cares about Lydia. Raised by this paranoid father, the Beaufort siblings are well off, but no one is really happy. But this time, the two siblings have had enough and decide to fight back together. Lydia puts on a suit and goes to the launch in James' place. James, on the other hand, hits the road back to school to find the girl who gave him courage. He dances on the ballroom with Ruby in her queen's gown. Ruby, Jemima, Belle. Suddenly, their romantic mood is interrupted once again. A fuse has blown. Hand in hand, they find the switchboard and turn on the backup. So the party can go on. In a quiet corner, with ambiguous lighting, a rendezvous is essential. They finally go from haters to lovers, imprinting on each other's lips. However, the sparks of passion between them ignite a time bomb. James' father's appearance ruins everything in an instant. He lies that Bahal is in chaos, causing Ruby to rush out. Then he angrily drives James to his car. Under his threat, Lydia has no choice but to leave the school in silence, without saying goodbye to her lover. Upon returning home, her father angrily scolds the siblings for ruining an important moment for the company. Lydia is prevented by him from walking into the launch event to give her speech. James is in tears as he is scolded. He is too scared to argue, so he goes out in a huff. But when he hears his father disparage Ruby as a gold digger who sells her body to climb the ladder, James can't stand it any longer. He warns his father not to belittle Ruby, but is punched to the ground. The driver immediately runs over to James and stops his father from hitting him again. The driver knows how important Ruby is to James. He watches James grow up and becomes a cold and unfeeling man. It isn't until Ruby came along that he saw the smile on James' face grow. The driver knows James even better than his father, but as an outsider, the driver can't interfere in Beaufort's family affairs. The ruthless father can't stand the idea of his son falling in love with a poor girl. He blackmails James by threatening to break up with Ruby immediately, or he'll not only deny her a scholarship, he'll prevent her from attending Oxford. And he's going to destroy Ruby's family, her mother's bakery, her sister's dream, the house she's lived in for 18 years without paying the mortgage. All of it becomes a bargaining chip for his father's threats. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ruby has no idea that James is in trouble. The fundraising gala is such a success, she gets a letter of recommendation from the headmaster. She messages James to share her joy, but until the next morning, James doesn't reply. She comes to the school to talk to James. To her dismay, James quickly passes her by with a stern look on his face, as if she doesn't even exist. The others treat her like a laughing stock, mocking her for being dumped. Ruby isn't that kind of girl who would kill herself for love, but she needs an answer, one that will make explain this awkward situation. She goes to the field to find James and asks him why he's ignoring her. In response to her touch, which is sweet enough to melt his heart, James feigns indifference and chooses to play the jerk. It was just a kiss. To keep his father from destroying her, James doesn't tell the truth. Even if Ruby hates him for it, he has to protect her. He degrades her as a toy, puts on a helmet to cover his broken heart. Ruby is a tough girl. Even with her broken heart, she doesn't give up her job. However, when she returns home, her parents reject her goodwill. It turns out that her intention to buy her disabled father a stairlift was discovered. With multiple blows, Ruby runs back to her bedroom and bursts into tears. She doesn't know that James is in no less pain than she is. James spends his days getting drunk, trying to numb his broken heart with physical pain. His mother advises him to let it go. She says sometimes, people make each other unhappy, no matter how much they love each other. Since then, Ruby and James no longer have any contact. Ruby focuses all her energy on her studies. But the mean girls couldn't leave her alone. Elaine leads the mockery of her being dumped by James. Whatever, Elaine. I can't see him. I go to you. Ruby is determined to cut off all ties to James. She returns the bag he gave her. But when she sees the sketch he drew of her, she can't resist. She was going to throw it in the trash. But in the end, she just locks it in a drawer. The two of them officially become strangers and go back to their different worlds. As time passes, luck finally strikes Ruby. That day, Ruby receives an invitation for an interview at Oxford University. And then her sister brings her another piece of good news. The burnt Victorian dress had been repaired by her sister and sold online for a whopping £500. And it's just enough money to buy her father a stairlift. 
Meanwhile, James is packing for his interview at Oxford. His mother hands him a pocket watch to wish him luck. His great-great-great-grandfather wore this watch from rags to riches, and it was passed on to his mother. James, however, treats it very roughly. The power, the opportunities, the connections his mother talks about are just a heavy burden to him. He doesn't want to inherit the company or go to Oxford. But he knows he carries the hopes of many, so he won't step out of line. James leaves for Oxford, ignoring his mother who stuck him with the responsibility. He could never have imagined that this unhappy parting with his mother would become a lifelong regret. On the other hand, Ruby arrives at the world-famous university for her interview with great anticipation. As soon as she steps off the bus, a handsome senior comes to help her with her luggage. He even shows her the way to the dormitory. Ruby excitedly makes her way to the door of the antique dormitory. What a small world. The guy who lives across the corridor from her is James. Ruby runs into her room in embarrassment, leaving James petrified in front of his door. The next day she sneaks out of the house like a thief, afraid to run into James, until she steps on the lawn of Oxford University. Ruby breaks into a smile. Over the centuries, many Nobel Prize winners, heads of government and other famous people have been educated here. Ruby gets excited at the thought that she might be one of them. She is too absorbed to look around and accidentally bumps into someone else. Coincidentally, it is Jude, the sophomore who helped her with her luggage. Jude shows them around, explaining what the three interviews are about and what to look out for. Standing upstairs, James catches sight of Ruby and Jude chatting and laughing. As jealous as he is, he has to hold back his thoughts of her until it's Ruby's turn to interview. When she passes by him pretending not to see him, he can't help but hold her hand. <laughs> Seems like his right hand has no idea what his left hand is doing. Though nervous before the interview, Ruby does an excellent job once she enters the door. She impresses the teachers with her point-by-point -point argumentation and logical nature. She passes the first round with flying colors, and there are two more rounds waiting for her. In the evening Jude takes Ruby to the turf tavern to relax. As soon as she enters, her attention is caught by James' cheerful laughter. She pretends not to see and quickly passes him by. James quickly notices her. As he watches Ruby chatting and laughing with other men, James can only drink in silence. Apparently, his presence is too much for Ruby. Being so close to him makes it difficult for Ruby to act as if nothing is happening. She escapes outside to get some air, only to find Lydia vomiting. Well, turns out Lydia can't keep the news of her pregnancy from Ruby. Not only is Lydia pregnant with Mr. Sutton's baby, but she wants to give birth to the baby. Ruby gets a shock when she learns the news. But she soon gives Lydia her support, saying, there are good programs for mothers at Oxford. Ruby then says she's confident that Lydia will be able to balance caring for the baby with her studies, because she knows Lydia is a good and strong woman, even though they are not friends. Lydia tells her James is heartbroken. Lydia walks away without explaining more, leaving Ruby confused. She'd been up all night trying to figure out what Lydia meant by that. James was the one who asked her to break up with him, so why was he in agony? She hears James's footsteps and wants to ask him for clarification. But she still doesn't have the courage to push open the door. Meanwhile, James is walking back and forth outside the door, trying to see the love of his life through the door panel. But recalling his father's threats, he runs away in desperation. The next day, after staying up all night, Ruby goes through a second round of stressful interviews. When it is over, the applicants gather to wait for the results. Encouraged by his friends, James plucks up the courage to approach Ruby. However, the seat next to her is taken by Jude, who appears out of nowhere. During the student QA session, Jude even cast ambiguous glances and smiles at Ruby. Now James is even more upset with him. He purposely interrupts Jude's speech, questioning whether he is qualified to give an introduction to the group. Obviously, Ruby thinks he's just being disruptive. She says he's gotten scary, that he's acting like his father and saying things like that. When it comes to his father, they both get aggressive. Like their first quarrel, Ruby's words still hit a nerve with James. But this time it isn't James who's running away, it's her. James hastily chases her to the dormitory and stops her. Even though he's speaking his mind, he's afraid to defy his father and refuse to tell her the truth. Ruby doesn't understand why his behavior is so contradictory at all. She's so angry that she runs away, unable to bear the pain of losing her again. James decides to fight for what he wants. The two of them intensely unleash their raging hormones from hallway to room. However, Ruby soon calms down. She can't get over what James said to her. Seeing her in such distress, James tells her the truth. He was forced to break up with her to protect her and her family under the threat of his father. Tears streaming down Ruby's face as she asks him to stop keeping secrets from her. As the misunderstandings between the two clear up, their relationship intensifies. 
Alles für dich, was du willst. Freund, Bonus, Freund, alles. To help him find motivation, Ruby makes a list of things he likes to do. She's going to liberate him, to get him to be open to change, to take advantage of the opportunities. James plucks up his courage and walks out of the interview hall he hates, against all the people's expectations. Ruby successfully concludes the final round of interviews. The two of them reluctantly say goodbye at the station and go back to their respective homes. However, James's illusions of a better future are shattered by a tragic event. Just as he gets home, he is startled to hear that his mother died of a stroke the night before. He can't see a trace of sadness in his father's face. What devastates him even more is that his father is still taking care of his business as if nothing has happened. At this moment, James' long-suppressed temper finally explodes. He jumps on his father and punches him one after another to vent his anger. Stopped by the driver, he leaves the cage without looking back. He stumbles to Ruby's house. Ruby's family is happily enjoying dinner. But he stands outside the window and hesitates to enter. Maybe he is afraid of disturbing them, or maybe he thinks that this kind of happiness doesn't belong to him. Anyway, the lovely life of a family of four makes James very envious. He looks at the pocket watch his mother left him while looking at the love of his life. He finally knows what he wants. It's time for a radical change. This is Maroon Recap. If there's a movie you'd like to watch, feel free to leave a comment and let me know. Let's watch a movie together and experience something different. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.